and I'm going to introduce our speaker today for uh, the semester's first top sum lecture and our first ever virtual top sum lecture. Um, we're proud to have Professor Mark Iwin today who's going to tell us about uh, from COVID-19 to sparse Fourier transforms in 50 minutes flat. And before I let him take over, um, since this is sort of a new process, why don't we try to ask questions in chat or raise hand and I'll try to monitor the chat. And if I need to stop uh, Professor Iwin and let him know there's a question, I, I can do that. So, all right, Mark, floor is yours. All right, thanks a lot, Ben. And uh, hello everybody who's wandered in. Um, my intention is for this to be an easy to follow talk given that it's Friday evening and, um, and uh, you know, we've had a lot of Zoom this week already. So it should be easy, hopefully, for everyone to understand. Uh, if it's not, um, ask me a question. There shouldn't be anything too, too difficult here, I, I think. So let's go on and see what group testing is all about. Uh, so it's been in the news lately. Here's uh, something from the Scientific American, uh, for example, um, from May. Uh, that's talking about coronavirus uh, testing shortages that existed. This was definitely a problem back in March and April. And uh, people were scrambling and trying to figure out how to uh, test for uh, coronavirus um, with all the people who are coming in with limit limited testing supplies. So this gives you your first clue about what uh, these pooling diagnostic samples um, uh, involves what group testing involves or as they call it here group screening and the the other important thing i'd like to point out is this uh, second phrase here that with a little math you can do more tests with less uh, supplies so there's some some positive impact that mathematics can have in this type of testing situation the other interesting thing about this article is that apparently there's another iwin in um in the nebraska public health uh who was using group testing to try to actually do this in practice back then. And so if you remember nothing else from this talk, it can be that IWINS and group testing seem to go together somehow. Okay, so let's see what group testing actually is and let's do it by maybe delving into some of the interesting or what I think is interesting history of, of uh, group testing. So it goes back to uh, 1940 to a very similar, or the 1940s to a very similar type of situation uh, to what we have now, at least a similar type of disease. Back then, though, it was uh, intertwined with, uh, with uh, World War II, which had just started. And the issue was that uh, back then, the United States would uh, draft soldiers from the general population. Everybody had a number, and you would get a draft number, and you would have to show up to the recruitment office to potentially serve in the army if you were healthy enough. And one of the things that they would test to see if you were healthy enough was for the presence of this spiral-shaped bacteria right here, um, which caused a disease called syphilis, which is treatable now, but in the 1940s was uh, untreatable and would eventually lead to uh, uh, bad outcome for anybody who was infected. So they wanted to make sure that none of the soldiers they recruited uh, were sick with this so they didn't spread it to the other soldiers and make the entire army sick eventually, um, one way or another. Uh, so the problem was um, that though there were tests for this at that point incurable disease, um, the, uh, the tests were expensive and again in short supply, uh, similar to COVID tests in, in May, uh, April, and, and, um, and March of this year. And so they came up with an easy way to try to figure out what soldiers were sick using pooling samples back then, similar to what we saw in, in, in the Scientific American article. And the idea was since syphilis is rare in the population, uh, most of the recruits that they would have come into any recruiting office, they would do this randomly. So they would expect that there would only be a small number who would have this disease. And so they could attempt to, um, to find them uh, or to at least qualify a lot of people uh, for service easily by taking blood samples from multiple people, pooling them into a one beaker and then testing that one beaker for the presence of the bacteria that caused the disease. And 
So since it's a rare disease, more often than not, this beaker would test negative, showing that there was no syphilis bacteria in the, in the beaker, and it would qualify everyone who, who had contributed blood to the beaker for service. And they would only have to use one test to do this instead of testing everyone uh, individually, and so they saved money and, and uh, testing supplies. And so they started thinking about how far they could push this uh, situation. So let's sort of think about first how this works in practice and how we could potentially push this, um, this type of procedure in order to get more complicated types of, of uh, testing to work than maybe just pooling blood to see whether we can save tests overall. So here's a sort of situation where we have four recruits uh, that have come in. Uh, three of them are healthy, flexing uh, folks, and one of them is sick in a bathrobe with a, uh, with a thermometer in his mouth, right? Um, if I take a blood sample from, uh, from this healthy person here and put it into my beaker and test it, it's going to come back as, as uh, healthy, indicating that the person is not sick presently. Um, so that's what the happy face means. If, however, I take blood from this sick individual and test it, it's going to come back as this Mr. Yuck symbol, which is going to mean in this uh, case that the person is sick. So he has, for example, bacteria on his blood, and he should be disqualified from serving in the, in the military, for example. Um, if I take blood from two people, and one of them is healthy and one of them is sick, the sick person is still going to contribute bacteria to the blood sample, let's say. And so the test will come back as indicating that someone, one of these two individuals was sick. And in this case, we know it's the second one, right? Um, if, however, I took two blood samples from two healthy people and tested it, it would come back as healthy because neither of them contributed any uh, disease, bacteria, or virus particles in the case of COVID to this blood sample. So we would be able to see that both of these people are healthy from their pooled test results. Okay, so once you have this basic idea down and seeing how these tests work, you can use it to start figuring out um, who is sick in a line of recruits. Um, if you know that there are a small number of sick people using fewer tests. So let's suppose that we've, uh, we've got, have these four recruits and we know that one of them is sick, maybe because a big test, a pool of samples that we did before came back as showing someone was sick. Um, and we know that it's extremely unlikely that more than one person is sick because the disease is so rare. So we want to use now a small number of these expensive tests to figure out who this one sick person is who's in, who's in our line. So we're assuming there's one sick person and we want to use fewer than four tests to figure out who it is. So let's, for example, take blood from these first two individuals and test it and say it comes back as as healthy. So that indicates that no, neither of these two guys had bacteria in their blood, so they're both healthy. Um, and now if we know there's one sick person, it's one of these second two guys. So I can take blood from one of them, let's say the third one, and test it. And if it turns out that he's also healthy, for example, then we know that this person at the end who we didn't test was the one who made the initial test go off. So this is our one sick individual who we know is in line. Okay, so we used two tests now in order to figure out which of the four people was sick. And so we saved uh, uh, at least uh, one test, two tests here, as opposed to testing all four of them individually, right? So half as expensive, half as much testing supplies used. And you can develop an algorithm or a procedure for doing this more generally in order to, to figure out who's sick using similar test procedures. So in the case of just for the sake of writing down an algorithm and showing you what one looks like here. If we have four people and we always want to use two tests to figure out who one sick individual is, we can do the following thing. So we can line up our four recruits or our four, four samples, and we can mix um, uh, the first two samples together and test them in one beaker. Uh, if that test comes back as healthy, then the first two samples are healthy and they can both, uh, for example, be qualified for service if this is our World War II draft example. Um, otherwise, if it turns out to be sick and we know there's only one sick person, then the last two samples are healthy. So either way, after no matter which way the test turns out, we only have two unknown samples left. So if we've reduced the number of the four first Healthy, uh, health outcomes that we didn't know about to just two that we don't know about. And now we can pick one of those two and 
remove the rest of the ambiguity by testing that person. And if it turns out that that person is healthy, then the person we didn't test is sick. And if it turns out the person we test is sick, then the person that we uh, did test is the one sick person, obviously. And we, we have identified the one sick uh, individual in our line of four, again, using two tests, no matter how the tests turn out, okay? So this seems to work quite well. Uh, the next question you might wanna ask is, what do we do if we have two sick recruits uh, instead of one? right? Having just one sick recruit is fairly restrictive. And maybe we have two sick recruits hidden, hidden in an even larger group of people. So here we have eight people. We don't know whether they're sick or not. So what I'm going to do here is um, break them up into groups and start testing the groups of them to see who's sick. So maybe let's say I test these first, into these first two um, of the eight people and someone in, it, someone in there is sick, right? So I I mark that down. That means um, uh, I've, I've identified at least where one of my two sick people are. And so maybe I test the next two. And if that also comes back as six, now, uh, sick, now I know that because there are exactly two sick recruits uh, in this line that everyone else that I haven't tested yet is healthy. So I can sort of say, all right, you guys can go. Um, I've sort of divided it into, again, removed half of the, of the people as being healthy. And I can start testing more among this other group in order to figure out who's healthy and who's sick. So in my first group of two here that I tested, I can test the first one, let's say, and see whether he's the sick one. It turns out that he's healthy based on my test result. And so this second guy has to be the sick one, right, in this group. And now here I just have one little bit of ambiguity left. I need to figure out which one of these two guys is sick. One of them should be because I'm assuming that we have two sick folks. So I'll test the third, or this guy, the third in the overall line, the first in this group. And if he comes back as being the sick individual, then I've identified where the sick individual is. Um, and I've identified my two sick recruits out of eight with four tests. So again, four tests instead of the eight, it would have taken me to measure everyone's health uh, individually. So now you can sort of see a pattern um, developing here and maybe a, a general strategy of how we can do this in a, in a more general setting. And in order to sort of identify what this pattern is and to get a better, uh, get, allow mathematics to tell us how to do this in a more optimal way, let me uh, encode this problem with the help of some uh, numbers and, and uh, some sort of basic mathematical objects so that I can then start reasoning about how to set up an optimal testing strategy of this type in significantly more general situations. So what I'm gonna do in order to start this, this uh, off is I'm gonna take my line of sick and, and healthy individuals, so healthy, sick, healthy, healthy, sick, and I'm gonna encode them as a set of zero and one numbers, binary numbers. So. I'll make healthy people, I'll represent them with a zero. They're sort of uninteresting somehow. They don't need to go to the hospital. They're not gonna be expensive and, and need help. And I'll identify the sick individuals with ones. They're the ones that are um, gonna need to go to the hospital or be treated somehow. So I just create a, sequen a, a vector of zeros and ones to represent my, my recruits. And now I'm gonna represent my testing scheme in the following way. So I'm going to, uh, take this pooling procedure where I'm creating beakers full of uh, blood samples from these different individuals. Um, and I'm going to represent each beaker with a row of a matrix. So it's going to be a matrix with K rows. Each row is going to correspond to a, a beaker. And each row is going to have a one in a particular location if the corresponding person's blood is going to go into the beaker. And it'll have a zero if their blood doesn't go into the beaker. So this is gonna be a matrix of zeros and ones also. Um, here is my, uh, my uh, vector representing my sick folks. So the beakers are gonna multiply this vector of sick individuals. And that's basically gonna tell me whether or not the blood of a sick or healthy individual was included in each one of these beakers represented by the rows of this matrix. And I will, then assume that the result of this matrix vector uh, multiply is given to me here as y. 
And I'm going to use sort of Boolean arithmetic instead of uh, regular arithmetic so that effectively I will get a one here if I included the blood of someone who is sick in my, in my beaker after I test the beaker. And I'll have a zero if I only included the blood of healthy individuals um, in that beaker. So this is gonna be another um, uh, vector with, well, of length K, the number of tests that I use on each beaker. That is again, zeros and ones. And what I wanna do is using this result, why I want to figure out um, based on these beakers that I tested represented in this matrix vector multiply, I wanna have some algorithm like I did before in the case of the four recruits in order to decode where the two sick individuals are in line. So let's say these are two sick individuals in line. I wanna be able to figure out where both of them are by working only with the result of my beakers uh, that I test this Y. And so the problem is uh, mathematically now that we can sort of state in a more rigorous way. So if I assume that disease is rare, so there are at most little k ones in this vector, in my initial vector, in other words, at most little k sick people that I'm testing, how small can I make capital K, the number of rows in my measurement matrix, and still be able to recover the, the vector A, the initial vector, uh, using my measurements. And then I would like to you know, emphasize that if I can recover this vector A, then I will recover all the positions of the zeros and ones, and that'll tell me who is sick and who is healthy, right? So this is now a, a, a more rigorous mathematical statement that we can start thinking about. Uh, so, and it boils down to now coming, coming up with a good set of beakers, uh, whose blood to include or not is gonna come down to designing this binary matrix in a way so that uh, it has a minimum number of rows. Okay, so uh, the first um, question you can start asking now is if I uh, do what I was doing in the examples at the beginning of this talk, if I allow myself to adaptively sample different subgroups of the, of the recruits and then use the results from my prior sampling attempts in order to, to uh, do more sampling in order to figure out who is sick. So in a sort of iterative testing procedure, um, what's the fewest number of tests that I can use? Uh, so what's the fewest number of beaker designs that I would have to come up with these, these matrices? And the sort of answer is, uh, if you think about it for a little while, I can do log n rounds of testing um, because if you notice in the examples previously, I was reducing the number of people whose health I was unsure about by half every time I sort of was finished with one round of testing. And uh, the way I can make sure that I only have to do log n rounds of testing is to take my total initial population, split it up into 2K plus one rows, or just 2K rows would also work, where K is the maximum number of sick individuals I expect to see. And then if I uh, split it up any way I like into 2K groups and test blood samples from those um, N divided by 2K individuals, I'll be guaranteed if there are most K sick people that uh, half of the total population will come back as registering as healthy from this round of testing and I'll be able to eliminate them from the future testing and focus on the half where there are sick people still residing. And then I will test again in the similar way until I uh, sort of zone, uh, home in using effectively a binary search strategy on the small number of people who are actually sick. So uh, K log N tests are what you should be able to expect to, to do in order to get things to work, especially if we use this sort of adaptive testing um, scheme um, using this sort of easy, easy recovery. Okay, so let's, um, let's now look at another way of, do, of solving this problem that's a little bit, uh, a little bit different and leads to a different um, type of non-adaptive group testing uh, family of procedures, which also appear in other types of applications, uh, like these Fourier transform things that, that are in the title of the, of the talk that we said we were gonna talk about later. So here's another um, group testing matrix construction. Uh, where I assume there's one non-zero entry in my vector A. So this could also be a line of recruits where there's only one sick person, which happens to be in the fourth position. But remember, I don't know where they are when I start. I only get to see the results of the matrix vector multiply. 
And in this case, the matrix is right here. It, each row represents a beaker, right? So this first row, I'm sort of putting the um, blood of every uh, odd numbered person um, into this beaker, and then I'll end up testing it to see what the result is. And the way I'm going to construct my, my beakers is the following. I'm just going to take the, the columns of this matrix. So I'm going to number them 0, 1, 2, 3 through 30. I'm saying there's 30 recruits here, let's say. So I'm going to take this column number and then write down the number of the column in binary uh, in, the, in that column. So this is 0 in binary, 1 in binary, 2 in binary, 3 in binary, et cetera, right? And now I claim that when I do my testing, which is going to be equivalent to this matrix vector multiply, I will get exactly the position of the sick individual encoded in binary, right? Because right? I'm effectively going to select the column. Um, this is going to select the column, associated column, in this case, this column right here. And then I'll use the test results and just read them off and get the position in binary of where the sick person is, right? It's a super fast, nifty way to do this. Um, it sort of tells you immediately you're going to need something like log base two of the, the total population in order to be able to do this very fast. Um, so recovery in this case is very easy. Uh, and to sort of hit, make sure that we understand how this is working and maybe to make sure that I'm not, uh, that there's, uh, this is making sense. Um, let me ask a question here. So if I didn't have to use test results, which are zeros and do this in binary, if I could make a matrix with any integer that I wanted, um, in, uh, in the, in the matrix, how many rows could I get away with using in order to identify where the, the one sick person was? Does anyone know? If I happen to allow to myself to use any integer here instead of just zeros and ones. So remember the one is going to select the column um, of, of the matrix, whatever matrix I'm using and output the result here. And what it's currently doing is it's just giving me the number of the, of the column where the sick individual happens to be, right? That's how this is working. So if I can use any integer here, can I do better than log base two of n? So uh, there's somebody has a, has a chat response, it looks like. Let me see if I can actually read it. Um, so, um, Luke says, let the entry in the nth column be n. Um, and that, yeah, that's exactly correct, right? So good job. Um, yes, so that's exactly it, right? If I could illegally use integers and I could just use the, the, the matrix with one row, that's 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And when I do this thing, this uh, matrix vector multiply, it's now going to be an inner product and 3 will pop out. And counting from 0, that's where the sick, you know, individual is. So that's all that's going on in this example. Um, good job. Uh, kudos to Luke for figuring it out. Um, yeah, so we can generalize this type of approach uh, a little bit more. So here's a mathematical definition of a matrix property, a combinatorial matrix property that'll let you solve this um, group testing problem for any k sick individuals hidden in a group of n people. Um, so it's going to be a binary matrix because we want to be able to use it with test results. And so the, the, the construction is the following. It's a K strongly selective matrix M, uh, is, uh, is going to be any matrix that has a property that if I choose a special column of the matrix, bold X, any column that I care about, and I choose any other K columns, uh, which I, have in, a, in this capital X collection. So any set of K other columns. Then there has to be a row in this matrix with a one in the first special column that I'm interested in and zeros in all of the other ones, okay? So there has to be a row that distinguishes between my special column and all of the other at most K columns and any selection of, of uh, K columns that I could have chosen. So let's see why this sort of potentially confusing looking construction is going to be helpful in this group testing problem. 
So here's our sort of line of recruits again, and I encode them in this, uh, this binary vector right underneath. So zero, one, one, right? One for sick people, zero for healthy people. And these four rows here are gonna be a matrix that has uh, this type of K-strongly selective property for this subset of people. So this matrix itself is not K-strongly selective, but it has the, the correct property, so you'll see why one would be useful for, uh, for this problem in general. So the way we're gonna use this property is the following. So I'm gonna pick some, some individual in line. Remember, I don't know what their health status is yet, so I'll just pick this first one. Um, so this will be my little x. And then I know that there are some group of three sick people, let's say in this line, I don't know where they are, but there's some group of uh, sick people. And so there should be a row in this matrix that has a one in this uh, first column and zeros in all of the other uh, sick columns. And it turns out that this third row has that property, right? So it includes this guy's blood, but doesn't include any sick people's blood, okay? That's what the property guarantees. And why is that helpful? Uh, it's helpful because um, the fact that it's guaranteed not to include any of these sick individuals and only include uh, healthy folks, in particular this one, tells me that this beaker is gonna test as healthy. And as soon as the beaker test is healthy, I know that only healthy people contributed blood to it. So I can go back and mark down everyone who contributed blood to this beaker as being healthy, right? And now uh, I've reduced the population where the sick individuals can be hiding, um, reduced the uncertainty in some sense. And so I can repeat the same game again because this matrix has this wonderful combinatorial property. There's gonna be some row that include, includes the blood of this healthy individual, for example, but none of the blood of the sick individuals. And so there's guaranteed to be a beaker that'll test healthy that will mark this guy down as being healthy. So this uh, last one, for example. And so after I'm done with this procedure of just uh, taking the, the beakers that test as healthy and marking everyone who contributed blood to them as being healthy, I'm guaranteed to have found all the sick individuals in my population and they'll just be the people who I never marked as being healthy. Okay. So um, this uh, K strongly selective matrix, it has a simple recovery um, algorithm that we just sort of went over. Um, you take all the, all the beakers that evaluate to healthy, so only healthy people contributed blood to them, you mark those people as healthy, and then as long as you have a K-strongly selective matrix and there are at most K-sick individuals, you'll find all of the sick individuals, they'll be the ones you never marked healthy, right? So um, the theorem then that we've effectively shown how one can prove is that if you have this matrix, it can let you uh, recover any vector with at most K non non zeros in it using the results of this matrix vector multiply um, using binary arithmetic. And the other interesting thing is that uh, one can prove that you can construct matrices that have this nice combinatorial property um, that have k squared log n rows. So if k is small, if there are a small number of sick people in a big population n, then you can use a relatively small number of beakers and use this simple procedure in order to identify from those from these k squared log n tests who all of the k sick people are in the population, right? So, um, in the in the case of of COVID, this could tell you that you might want to do something like mail everyone a, a, a test and have them mail them back to some testing center. Combine the tests using a group testing approach plus the combination that or the the information that COVID is rare um, And then use one of these group testing approaches to sort of figure out who uh, Of the people who mailed back tests is actually sick something like this it could be a way to monitor a population for disease outbreak um, And that's exactly the way that it is used uh, in in applications like that Okay, so the nice thing is, uh, once you've figured out how to, how to solve this, this uh, disease testing problem, and you've abstracted the problem, so you've used some mathematics to figure out how to do this um, in a more abstract setting, you can start using this abstracted problem to do a whole bunch of other interesting things. 
So one of those other interesting things you can do is error detection and transmission in electronics. So um, in particular, uh, we know that our computers that we're using right now for this talk uh, work by uh, dealing with sequences of binary numbers, right? So if I'm writing, for example, a file to the hard disk of my computer, um, it is just writing a sequence of zeros and ones, um, and I can split them up into blocks of length n to the hard disk of my computer, right? Um, and uh, same thing for DVDs, CDs, other sort of old school technology at this point that you might have in your house. Um, same sort of thing. You're writing sequences of bits to your uh, uh, to a disk or of some kind and reading it off later. So the question is, though, that um, errors are rife in every single real life application. So I might want to write this this uh, vector a of zeros and ones to a hard disk and then come back and read that same file two days later. Um, but I might read something that's a little bit different. I might make a mistake and read one of these ones as a zero. Or maybe I wrote the one uh, as a zero in the first place. I made a mistake in one of the n digits as I was writing, right? This happens with some frequency because uh, reading and writing off of a hard disk is involves magnetizing and demagnetizing tiny portions of your disk and that is their errors occur, right? So how can you make sure that what you, you actually saved what you wanted to write and that you actually read back what was written there in the first place? Um, how do you make sure that you detect mistakes? So there are easy ways of doing this, like um, parity and checksums are, are sort of easy techniques you can use. So if I write uh, n zeros and ones like this to my hard disk, I can remember the number of ones mod two. So was it an easy, even number of ones or an odd number of ones that I wrote to my disk. And then uh, when I read it back later, I can make sure that that same number of, of uh, even or odd ones that I read is, you know, matches what I, what I saved as my check, as my parity bit. Or I could actually save the entire sum of the number of ones. So how many ones did I actually write? And then I can make sure that I read back the same number of ones as what I wrote in the first place. So uh, if you want to be able to correct errors that you make when you're reading back your sequence of bits from your hard disk, you can use exactly these types of uh, um, uh, K-strongly selective matrices that you use for group testing to help you do that. So the way this will work is if I'm writing to my hard disk, I would write my long sequence of bits, and then I would also write the result of my matrix times this long sequence of bits. And remember, um, if I'm expecting to have a small number of errors, then I'll have a small number of rows here. So this additional information that I write is not going to, not going to be very, uh, uh, not going to be very much extra information to put on the disk. Okay. Now later I come back and I read that same file. So I'll read A prime, which is gonna be the original sequence plus maybe some small vector with a small number of ones or zeros that flip, uh, flip the small number of bits, so let's say K bits, right? And so if I wanna see what, uh, whether or not I actually read back what I initially wrote, I can check to see whether this matrix M times what I read back matches this matrix M times what I initially wrote. And if they're equal to one another, I can be assured that um, either no errors occurred or more than K errors have to have occurred, which is presumably quite rare if I have a decent disk that's functioning properly, right? And, and more than that, if these, if these uh, values don't match, I can use that information to actually figure out what zero I accidentally read as a one or vice versa and repair the information um, using types of matrices like case strongly selecting matrices. So there's value in the abstraction that mathematics lets you do to problems like this. Um, and speaking of that types of, type of abstraction, um, let me show you another sort of situation where we have a small number of interesting things in a communication signal in this case, which I've sort of represented here in this uh, combination of sign functions. So, uh, in a lot of signal processing applications uh, or just listening to the radio, um, there are uh, signals out there that you want to grab with your radio transceiver, for example, um, or radio receiver, for example, 
that uh, involve you identifying a small number of frequencies that are active in a potentially large band of, of, uh, of frequencies. So here we have a, combina a, a combination of two sinusoids. So there's a frequency of size one and the frequency of size 100, right? And so there are two frequencies that make up this, this signal, um, but they're spread of spread apart over a big range. There are a hundred apart, even though there are only two of them. So there's some small number of interesting objects. Instead of sick people, it's now the frequencies that are active, two. And uh, the population, instead of a population where the sick people are hiding, it's sort of a range of frequencies or a bandwidth of frequencies, which is like a hundred large in this case, right? So can you group test the, um, the frequency domain to figure out where these uh, if I get to pick only look at random values of this function, can I figure out where these small number of frequencies are by observing this function in the, at a small number of points is sort of the question. And the answer, of course, is yes, or I wouldn't have brought it up. <laughs> so, um, and the application here is quite interesting. So let me tell you another story, which just so happens to go back to the World War II era um, that involves frequency hopping modulation schemes, um, uh, a way of communicating so that you can't be eavesdropped on. So the way this works, uh, and interestingly enough, it was developed by Hedy Lamarr, who is a famous um, World War II era actress, but much more importantly, had an, interesting in math, uh, an, an interest in mathematics and engineering. Uh, so the way this, that her communication scheme works, which is quite clever, um, in order to avoid being eavesdropped on, is uh, the following. So let's say that I want to um, travel um, uh, far away from someone that I'm in, that I'm uh, collaborating with, or I'm in the military and that I'm talking to someone else in the military and I don't want to be eavesdropped on. So what I'm going to do is we're both going to uh, synchronize our watches and then come up with a, a pseudo random number generator that's going to um, pick frequencies for us to talk on on our radio that hops over a massive, massive range, a really huge range of frequencies. So it's going to keep jumping all over the place. But we won't notice because our, our uh, radios in the background will just be varying the frequency that we talk on as we are talking and hopping all over the place, right? So we don't notice because our radios are doing this uh, automatically. But an enemy that's trying to listen to us and see what we're saying will be frustrated because if they manage to find where we're talking at one moment, um, a few you know, uh, fractions of a second later, our radios will hop really far away and they'll lose us and we'll be talking over here next. And they'll have to scan through a giant range of frequencies in order to try to find out where we are, right? So this is a nice scheme um, that you can uh, defeat if you use group testing type tactics, uh, potentially. So the idea being that if you have a very fast method for scanning through large ranges of frequencies very quickly to identify where we've hopped to when we hop somewhere new to talk, then when we jump somewhere and start talking there in our frequency hopping modulation scheme, you can very quickly find that new sparse set of frequencies that we're using in order to speak on and sort of find us quickly and start listening to us again without missing much of anything. So another application where this small number of active frequencies can uh, um, allow a fast group testing procedure to uh, do something like overcome uh, uh, a, pri a, a private communication strategy based on frequency hopping modulation schemes. And there are other applications in uh, in medical imaging as well that are related. So um, just to quickly mention, uh, there's this interesting area called compressive sensing, where you try to come up with patient images like this using an, uh, of this person's veins. So these are veins, a small num relatively small number of white pixels. And you want to identify these white pixels by sampling the Fourier transform of this image. Um, and then use that information based on a small number of samples in order to figure out where the, the veins and the leg of this person are and, and see what they look like. So the sparsity here is the small number of, of pixels in the veins of this image. And you wanna do a small number of sampling because uh, that corresponds to how much time they have to sit in the machine and how long it's tied up for each patient. Okay, so you can uh, have- Can I interrupt yeah. you for a second? You have a question I've been trying to- um... 
yeah, there's a question in the chat. Ah, uh, yeah, okay, sorry, that's good. Uh, let me see. Um, do we need memory for A, A, M, and M? Uh, so for, uh, for this error correcting application, you would, you would write um, A and M times A, and you would, you would have some particular matrix M that you are always using. So it would be sort of built into how your disk works effectively. Um, you would, you wouldn't, it would be saved probably because it would be hard coded into your disk if that answers the question. But uh, yes, you would write A and M times A. You would read back A as A prime. You would compute A times A, uh, M times A prime and then see whether they were the same as an example. Yep, good, thanks. Uh, yeah, interrupt me whenever, Ben, sorry about that. <laughs> um, yeah, so to abstract this, this 4A uh, problem a little bit, so you can abstract this uh, in the following sort of setting. So let's say we have a really large range based on this parameter n of integer, uh, where integer frequencies omega one through omega k can be hiding. So these are integers in this big interval of size n, capital N. Small number of frequencies, just k of them. And I wanna to try to evaluate this function at as few places as possible and still figure out um, from this large range of frequencies where uh, these hidden integers are. So what are these integers in my approximation? And in the case of my um, signal processing example, finding these frequencies would be sort of similar to figuring out where we had hopped to and where we were now uh, talking in one of these frequency hopping modulation schemes, for example. So we want to do this efficiently and using a small number of samples from F is absolutely possible and be very fast. Okay, so Existing techniques for doing this um, by sort of evaluating this function um, on equally spaced uh, evaluation points would require you to use capital N evaluation points at um, points in the interval zero to two pi that are spaced, you know, two pi over N apart. And then you could use a fast Fourier transform, um, which some of you may have seen uh, uh, Craig uh, talk about um, to do this in n log n time to figure out what the entire set of frequency 4a coefficients were these guys um, for all of these and then you would find the ones that were non-zero and that would tell you what these were but this doesn't take sparsity into account there's no in nowhere does this traditional solution use that there are only k non-zero coefficients uh, in this this uh, this function expression right so Instead, what you can do is modify a group testing approach um, in order to do this more efficiently. And so let me show you how to do this in one sort of special example where we have one non-zero 4A coefficient. So here, uh, there's only one non-zero frequency and we get to take samples from the function in order to try to figure out where it is in, the, in this range of capital N. Okay, so here, our capital N is just six so it's not that big, but I want to be able to fit this into the, into the slide. So it's big enough. Our one non-zero frequency is here. Let's pretend we don't know where it is, but for the sake of, of, uh, of having a, a slide that makes sense, um, here it is. It's got a Fourier coefficient uh, is 3.5 and it's in the zero, one, two position. And what I'm gonna do is effectively group test my frequency spectrum using this matrix right here. So this matrix is gonna be constructed um, by taking two prime numbers, two and three, and basically taking identity matrices of size two and three and sort of putting them next to each other in these blocks. And if you look at each one of these rows, it turns out that the ones are appearing in uh, positions that are congruent to zero mod three in this case, or one mod three, et cetera. Uh, even in odd positions in these top two rows. So there's some sort of number theoretic structure behind this matrix, which means that when I perform this matrix vector multiply, what I'm gonna get as my result, which I actually can see, is this non-zero 4A coefficient repeated twice. So once for the blocks associated with two and once for the blocks associated with three in positions that tell me what the original coefficients position was congruent to both two and three. And now, if you remember your, your number theory class, you can use the Chinese remainder theorem to decode that this non-zero coefficient must have been in the second position and had uh, 4A 
and had the actual coefficient value of 3.5, which appears twice. And the matrix I used here is, uh, has one fewer row than just doing what would be uh, effectively equivalent to looking at the, each entry individually, which would be sort of multiplying by an identity matrix, if you like. Okay, so in this one example, we save a little bit, but this was cheating because I was somehow group testing the frequency spectrum directly, but I told you before that we only get to see uh, function evaluations, right? We can't group test the frequency spectrum uh, directly. Um, so let's see how to, uh, um, how to fix that problem. So I'm gonna take a discrete Fourier transform and it's inverse. So uh, they're invertible functions. Uh, so I've done nothing here. And now I'm gonna regroup. This now is the inverse discrete Fourier transform of my, uh, my unknown vector with, with the non-zero frequency here. And so this is actually gonna correspond to something I can see. These are function evaluations of my, my trigonometric polynomial um, at, equally, at six equally spaced points in the interval zero to two pi. So I can actually look at these function values if I want. And so my objective now is to look at as few of them as necessary in order to figure out where this, where this frequency is. And the matrix that I'm using to look at those function values is now given by this, um, this guy. And it turns out that if I do this matrix vector multiplication, the number theoretic structure of this group testing matrix will interact very nicely with my discrete Fourier transform matrix. And it will turn into something that looks like this. So I'm gonna get two columns in the result, which are entirely zero, which means that I don't even have to look at the corresponding um, entries of this vector, this big vector over here, because if I did, I just multiply them by zero anyways. So I only have to look at four of the six equally spaced samples. And furthermore, I can compute the result of, of this matrix vector multiply quite quickly and efficiently because I'm just taking two equally spaced subsamples of these six that I have available and doing a smaller discrete Fourier transform. And here are three equally spaced and doing a smaller discrete Fourier transform. So it's efficient, I can do it easily. And the result, notice, um, is, hasn't changed from what happened in our initial example. So I can still decode in the exact same way. And figure out that I had my 4A coefficient was 3.5 and it was in position uh, two, counting from zero. And I actually saved two of the evaluation points that I would have had to look at if I were gonna do a regular DF discrete 4A transform. Okay, so you can prove that this works. Uh, there are entirely deterministic methods for recovering functions with K non-zero 4A coefficients or approximating more general functions by sparse functions that have a runtime that depends on the sparsity or the number of non-zero frequencies squared. They're totally deterministic. You can randomize and make them faster and prove that everything works, get some nice error bounds. Um, more interestingly, maybe for folks who like to program and so forth, you can actually implement these algorithms and use them and show that they're faster than standard FFT techniques. Again, using exactly modified versions of this uh, group testing approach that we just saw in the one frequency sparse setting, of course, quite a bit more complex in order to work for general uh, numbers of frequencies. But here in this plot, what we're doing, we have arrays of size uh, uh, two to the 26. So they're very long vectors. Um, and the discrete Fourier transforms of those vectors have a relatively small number of non-zeros. So like a thousand, for example. So the, the number of non-zero frequencies hidden in this, um, in this vector is here on the horizontal axis of this plot. And now I'm plotting the runtime it takes for the, an algorithm based on this group testing approach in green and red, two of them, to recover uh, vectors with this number of non-zero 4A series coefficients. And here this blue line is what we're sort of comparing against. This is a regular fast 4A transform algorithm, FFTW, um, uh, 3.2 something or other, I think, the most recent one as of uh, about a year ago. Um, it's n log n time. It doesn't care about sparsity at all. So it only is based on the length of the vector. Um, and it's the blue value here, highly optimized code. And the point is, if you take the sparsity into account, if you know that there are a small number of frequencies, only 2,000, for example, you can do faster 
um, compute this faster than you can with the regular FFT. Um, so in fact, this code for the, the red line here, which is something that uh, some students and I worked on is publicly available. So if anyone in the audience really likes coding, you can go to the SourceForge site and uh, download it and mess around with it all you want and figure it out. It's kind of fun, I think. Um, so group testing can help in a lot of different places. You can, uh, once you abstract things mathematically, you can take really interesting approaches that help with things like uh, testing for disease and end up using them for productive things in surprising places like computing 4A transforms more, uh, more quickly. And uh, so with that, I'll, I'll just conclude. Uh, thank you all for showing up and um, uh, remind you that there's an upcoming election and, and sort of uh, tell everyone that I hope you all register to vote. Um, and it's, uh, it's something that's worth skipping class over or skipping an assignment if you have to. It's um, something that I hope everyone who's, who's watching